Well, my entire career has been in international development, and I've worked with a lot of leaders over the years. involved with uh, G20 uh, finance ministers and I've been involved with other figures such as Prince El Hassan of Jordan and uh, Tony Blair and I was involved with Gordon Brown and also um, Nicolas Sarkozy. So these are all people who have helped to shape some of my views about what I think may be lying ahead in terms of the uh, global political and economic situation. Good evening. Um, welcome to IPPR. Uh, my name is Tony Dolphin. I'm the senior economist here. Uh, I'm just going to say a very few words before handing over to, uh, to Greg Fisher, who's um, uh, managing director of Synthesis, who's going to sort of run the show this evening. Um, as I said, I just wanted to say that this seminar for us is part of a program of work we're running called New Era Economics. Um, the idea of that is to look at new ways of thinking about the economy, uh, potential new goals um, that the economy could set itself, to look at new challenges which are facing the economy, and to try and bring that thinking and the ideas, uh, those ideas to policymakers. I know very little about uh, the subject we're going to hear about today, so I'm going to be a very interested audience member, uh, looking and listening and uh, trying to understand what I can take from this um, to take to policymakers. One of the key uh, roles for me of think tanks is to listen to interesting new ideas and to try, and it, it can be tough at times, but to try and make them relevant for uh, policymakers down the road in Westminster and in the rest of the country. So the discussion is um, uh, new era economics um, and and the commons, and the sub question, the subtext question, is can the new field of complex systems help us manage the commons better? To the far left is Rhett Gale. Uh, Rhett is a philosopher whose work is primarily focused on education and methods for improving thinking. So without any further ado, uh, James Quilligan. I am not going to be talking about policy tonight, particularly, if that's what you're looking for. A little more about the philosophical or contextual background of where I see complexity economics and some other developments as they pertain to this emerging field called the commons. The commons are this emerging field that is rapidly uh, penetrating into a lot of different disciplines. And you may know it because of Eleanor Ostrom and her work, but there are also a number of other commons activists around the world who are contributing to the emerging theory. So it's a very exciting movement, and it's, uh, it's creating quite a bit of buzz uh, among uh, policymakers, I think but uh, particularly in the area of um, civil society, it's making its biggest mark. As you know, over the past 40 years, human demand for renewable resources has overwhelmed the Earth's capacity to produce them. During the same period, ecological economists like Kenneth Boulding, Nicholas georgescu rojan Herman Daly, and Robert Costanza have been considering the interdependence and co-evolution of natural ecosystems and human economies in time and space. The present economics of utility, efficiency, and cost-benefit analysis arose from the 19th century economics, which was based on Newtonian physics. 19th century economics made three seminal errors which remain in our current system all of which demonstrate that the idea of a value-free economics is unrealistic and unsustainable. In the first place, 19th century economics was conceived as a closed equilibrium system with no inputs from or outputs to the outside world. In other words, 
all energy originates and stays inside the system. The second problem with 19th century economics is that it was developed before the second law of thermodynamics was discovered. And this recognition still has not been incorporated into the economic system. Hence, there is no measure of entropy in our current economics to account for the disorder or randomness in the system that is increasing through time. These two errors led to a third era. Third error. Modern economists believe that self-interest and perfect rationality are the drivers of human incentives in the economy. These views of human nature are made on the assumption that all of the variables in economics are causal. It's becoming more and more apparent that we cannot continue to base our social exchange systems simply on causal units like currency, prices, contracts, households, factories, corporations, jobs, consumer demand, individual preferences that follow rates of growth which are not commensurate with the biosphere in which they exist. Consumer demand, markets, technologies, business plans, stocks of natural resources, all of these fundamental units of economy are not static variables, but ever evolving. How do ecological economists make sense of this? Between the realm of linear causality and the realm of no causality or interaction among variables lies the area of complexity science. From systems theory, complexity theory, information theory, physics, biology, and other areas, we are learning that complex systems have a high diversity of components and a dense network of interactions between these components. Ecological economics, which is also known as biophysical economics or bioeconomics, looks at the intertwined and mutual causality and the dynamic feedback loops between a system's multiple components. Using complexity theory, ecological economists an analyze the flows of energy and materials that enter and exit the economic system. Ecological economics recognizes the economy as an open system with inputs and outputs. In this model, beneficial forms of solar, mi mineral, human, and animal energy are absorbed from outside the system and often end up as unwanted byproducts such as gases, waste, and pollution. Living organisms, river systems, ecosystems, urban networks, social systems, and business networks are examples of complex stock and flow systems. Flows of matter, energy, information, or money concentrate in a stock and are then recycled as a flow, whether this flow stock cycle is instantaneous or involves delays of varying duration. As Nobel, Nobel laureate Eleanor Ostrom explains in Governing the Commons, resource systems are best thought of as stock variables that are capable, under variable conditions, of producing a maximum quantity of a flow variable without harming the stock or the resource system itself. Recent literature on the commons reflects another aspect of complex systems. The commons look at three, uh, at several differential levels of human interactions with social ecological systems as holons. That is, a holon is a basic organizing component which is also part of a larger unit, which in turn is part of a greater whole and so on, all of which is scalable up or down. Hence, the beingness of the human being involves more than a steady state or natural order in which systems regulate and stabilize themselves through a network of feedback loops. We know that nature and society are both whole part systems, self-evolving and self-ordering. Why then are our material, biological, psychological, and social systems continually clashing. It's becoming clear that another whole part system exists besides those of society and nature. 
Increasing attention is being given to the possibility of similarly nested components, holes which supersede yet include preceding holes within the personal and intersubjective experiences and intentionality of the users and managers of the social and ecological systems. This is why we may be misled if we merely follow the outlines of the Gaia hypothesis. Typically, Gaia is defined as a complex entity involving the Earth's biosphere, atmosphere, oceans, and soil, the totality constituting a feedback or cybernetic system which seeks an optimal physical and chemical environment for the life on the planet. But Gaia is more than this. The common shows us that Gaia does not exist on its own, but is a collaborative effort, the joint creation of all who live on it. In other words, Gaia is not simply a material and organic construct. It also involves human consciousness and culture. Why are these human interiors so little researched in ecological economics? The study of multi-tiered hierarchies involving the psychological, ontological, and hermeneutic characteristics of human beings in organized interactions which may be of specialized interest in some fields of inquiry, is often viewed as beyond the scope of the social sciences and ecological economics. Hence, many attributes of interior human development, such as cognitive awareness, individual knowledge, rationality, self-identity, autonomy, moral capacity, responsibility, leadership, organizational capacity, common understanding, trust, reciprocity, shared worldviews, collective interpretations, and cultural values are identified in ecological economics as meaningful but disaggregated, non-quantitative, or exogenous variables. But the common studies, the experimental investigation into these interior qualities as multi-level developmental units, or holarchies, of the individual or group users and managers of social ecological resource systems is helping researchers develop new methodological safeguards against reducing these interior attributes into the behavioral or institutional correlates which exist in another realm. This is increasing the internal validity and reliability of the objective measures of complex interaction effects and outcomes involving a resource system, its units, its rules of governance, and its participants' actions, particularly in terms of the personal choices, capacities, implicit knowledge, decision-making, <coughs> intrinsic values, and motivations for self-interest or group cooperation in the on the part of resource users and managers. In his book, Full Spectrum Economics, for example, Christian Arnsberger cautions against economic models that rely primarily on a structuralist emphasis on inputs and outputs in complex systems without including the interiors of human consciousness. The whole lines of society, nature, and self are increasingly being discussed by Commons researchers, including Ostrom and her associates at Indiana University, as well as many scholars affiliated with the International Association for the Study of the Commons. There is a growing understanding on the part of these researchers that human behavior involving the co-governance and co-production of a commons is shaped more or less commensurately by the human brain, the mind and culture, and social relations. Scholars like Dr. Leandro Meyer and his associates in Brazil have accumulated clinical evidence that the integration of holarchies of biological and physical development, human interior development, and institutional development tend toward heightened behavioral freedom, declining egocentrism, growing inclusiveness and care for others, external objects and conditions, greater mutual understanding through communication, expanded cooperation, and increasing acceptance of normative sanctions. These findings suggest that the theory and praxis of whole part systems may lead to a worldview of developmental stages unfolding through a progressive evolution of nature, self, and culture, each of which appears to have its own internal drives.
these drives gravitate toward greater complexity, greater unity, and greater consciousness. The study of multi-tiered hierarchies involving the psychological, ontological, and hermeneutic characteristics of human beings in organized interactions with resource systems can also be viewed in terms of the complementarity of stocks and flows. This is where the commons becomes a vital part of the tracking uh, of tracking the met metabolism of society and nature. Like natural ecosystems, human economies are complex stock and flow networks. Some commons are stocks like soil, water, technology, atmosphere, air, minerals, DNA, and some are flows, electromagnetic spectrum, knowledge, ideas, arts, culture, social networks. This suggests to us a new theory of value. The most irreducible fact in economics is that resource systems are either depletable, that is natural, material, or replenishable, natural, social, solar, cultural, intellectual, digital. The only way depletable and replenishable resources can be conceived as an economic unity is through the relationships and connectedness that human beings share with them through the progressive evolution of nature, that is physical and biological development, self, human interior development, and society, institutional development. This suggests that value does not originate independently through communities or their resources, but in the relationship of the communities to those resources. This has many implications. The separation or distancing of the human mind from life and matter is the basis of economic and political dysfunction. Presently, the private economy depends on the goods and services provided by the public sector. The goods and services provided by the public sector are dependent on the commons. And the commons is an expression of mind, life, and matter. So this lack of integration between private goods, public goods, and common goods is the reason that we are constantly struggling to recognize how the individual fits in society and how society can support personal growth and creativity. When the individual is set in competition with the whole, the moral will and creativity of the people are suppressed. Mind and body are seen as separate units. Our being is split from our actions. This leaves us starved for the equality and freedom which express the relatedness of human life and which can arise only through our commons. We've begun to recognize that the society which sees itself as an inevitable polarity between the social good and individual rights destroys the forms of life that are rooted in the commons, which are the source of our livelihood and well-being. The commons offer a way of integrating the whole and the self, the collective state of the world, and the state of individual being. We're in the midst of a civilization-wide transition from hierarchical governance and institutional forms to ones which are based upon decentralization and peer-to-peer -peer interaction. The norms and rules which are being developed to oversee collective resources sustainably involve peer-to-peer -peer management and open source models. Innovative models and tools are emerging that, na that enable us now to organize and coordinate our activity in new ways, transforming the nature of community and social institutions. These systems include free software, open hardware groups, open media and educational models, open, open collaborative research in commerce and science, and horizontalist decision-making by social activists. Thanks to this growing evolutionary impulse, a new production and governance logic of learning by doing has become possible. As resource users become directly involved in the process of production, their local ideas, learning, imagination, deliberation, and self-corrective action are embodied directly in their collaborative activities. This expands the distribution of the means of production and decision-making far more widely than through top-down systems. 
When consumers become co-producers of the goods and services they receive and organize, their mutual activity transcends privatization, centralization, and the idea that institutional change can come only through a traditional command, and command structure or social hierarchy. As these evolutionary forms of technology and culture alter the nature of resource exchange systems, communities are engaging around projects in a deeper and more powerful way, creating new ways of interacting and coordinating social and economic life. We have recognized the complexity of social and natural systems in the external world, but we've only begun to see that the realization of these systems takes place through the human mind and culture. Hence, from the standpoint of the commons, we are indeed co-creators of the earth. The commons are not just the resources as measured by their flow of energy, materials, and ecosystem services in terms of biological evolution, sustainability, environmental quality, and economic development. They are also the set of relationships these resources create, including the communities that use them and the cultural and social practices and property regimes that manage them. The commons show us that value does not originate independently through communities or their resources, but in the relationship of the communities to those resources. Our task, ultimately, is to reconcile nature, society, and self in a commons-based economy where commons are the stocks and flows of the resources themselves, the people who preserve, produce, manage, access, and use them, and the social relationships that unite these resources with the people. Thanks. Thank you very much, James. <laughs> are very big fans of the Gaia hypothesis and so forth, and make exactly the sort of overlooking fact that you were pointing to, James, which is that we're part of Gaia, we're co-create. It's sort of like um, some of them go so far, it's like we're some sort of cancer on Gaia, which Gaia would be better off without, and, and that will get straightened out in due course. And even the ones that are a little bit more pro-human seem to think that we're kind of just sort of riding along with Gaia. So I was very excited with the idea that really it doesn't make any sense to think of us as being separate from the Earth in that way. Um, as a friend of mine would say, we're not living on the Earth, we're living in the Earth, since the atmosphere would be included. So I thought that was really exciting. There's a danger here, sitting here, listening to this, coming to this new, uh, I haven't heard you speak before. Um, it started to feel like quite a totalistic ideology um, in the sense of, you know, to, we, we want to unify, you know, uh, the individual as, a, you know, uh, as represented phenomenologically to themselves, also the environment and politics and economy. And since what's being discussed here is learning by doing, maybe, maybe you could say more about some of the just practical things that have happened. I mean, probably we all have examples practical things that have happened and kind of ways forward to, to sort of carry those on. So I'm kind of almost saying, can we be less, uh, it seems very ambitious, the, the, the way that you're selling this. Perhaps a better way of selling it is to say, well, look, here's a, here's a problem, here's how it can be solved in a new way. Mm -hmm. like uh, well, I, d I didn't really express it as a political totality in a, in a kind of, the, this is social policy from a, that point of view. I mean, I tried to put it in the framework of a sort of new epistemology to give us some guidelines. And I mean, you know, it wouldn't fit in the paper exactly, but the Commons is really dedicated to subsidiarity and decentralization and pluralism and polycentrism, checks and balances, horizontalist decision making, peer to peer interaction. And those are quite different than a kind of totalist vision. So it wasn't my intention to give that impression. If you had it, it's possibly partly because all unities that have been postulated in the past in history have usually turned into something totalistic. And all of us have the fear of the whole uh, suppressing the individual. And, um, and I share that fear with you. I see many, many things that are happening around the world which are very much built on a commons-based approach. Um, in fact, it's a very busy space. However, um, to the gentleman's point, 
in a sense, the commons and this idea of an open approach to what you're talking about is inherently political at the deepest level because it's about power. Who has it? Who controls it? Um, and I think, you know, my question as perhaps is, is to what point of breakdown of the current industrial model that we've got when actually people are prepared? Because it always seems to me that we have to really almost step into the abyss before humanity is actually prepared to stand back and sort of take a different type of look. So that's the kind of question that uh, uh, I'm asking, you know, how far do we need to go watching our financial systems break down, our agricultural systems? Um, Mr. Cameron, seven times last week talking about efficiency, um, <laughs> not about effectiveness, right? So that's really kind of the uh, point I wanted to put out into the, into the room. The commons is emerging precisely because um, it's, it's a, uh, a reaction to the oppression and the, the top-down uh, uh, decision-making, the command and control models, which are breaking down. And it's, it's really emerging, uh, it's a zeitgeist, it's emerging all over the world <laughs> to, from a bottom-up kind of standpoint. And it's calling itself commons, it's calling itself many other things, but I think commons is, is a... Uh, the synthesis of, of the meaning that is, has emerged. And uh, so I don't know how long it'll take, but it's certainly the bottom-up expression is, is happening rapidly.